Hello, everybody. Uh, this is Ursula Gantz in Switzerland, in Stanz. The sun is just shining. And I try to, um, to register my presentation, um, which will be in five pieces, I guess. And I start with some preliminary remarks. <coughs> My presentation deals with audience adaptations of contemporary pop songs that enjoy worldwide attention and worldwide distribution. I claim that pop, in terms of popular culture, is a somewhat natural habitat for learning purposes because pop culture is chosen freely uh, it's a thing of tastes and people usually like what they are doing. And so uh, learning while enjoying something comes pretty naturally. I uh, base my talk on two claims, which is A, popular culture as a resource for learning is neither good or bad. By this I mean popular culture is not better or worse than other resources for learning, which are culture, cultural resources for learning. It is all about how cultural resources are used in a more or less reflexive way that makes the difference. The difference between good and bad understood on the one hand side is difference between useful and useless in a given context, but also on the other side between functional and dysfunctional. I could say also um, the difference between something that is harmless and something that might even under some uh, in some particular context be harmful. And B Popular culture as entertaining practice necessarily and importantly involves talking, discussing, debating, showing and sharing with others what you seem to like enough to being talked about, discussed, heatedly debated, showed to others and particularly shared with others. This uh, claim I take over from Lothar Mikos, who also says that entertainment is more entertaining when you have somebody to share with and if you have somebody to discuss the value. So, while I claimed in the first instance that pop culture is neither better nor worse or other than other cultural resources, here I claim that people have an urge to value what they discuss. Uh, so as a, a user of popular culture, you tend to value it, to t say it's better than other things. It's good. What you do is good. It is bad. And importantly, negative talk can be as entertaining as positive talk. So hating things, uh, being against how somebody looks, um, is just as importantly entertaining as uh, when you say, oh, this is so beautiful. Loving and hating are two sides of playful conversation within uses of popular culture. And uh, for my talk, there is just one other preliminary, um, and it is the term of filking. Uh, filking is a practice that uh, Henry Jenkins described earlier on, around 1995, with regards to science fiction and fantasy culture. Filking means singing songs 
in little groups that gather, for instance, at conventions where sci science fiction uh, items are shared and discussed, people sit and sing songs. And since we are talking music, this filking can be an important puzzle piece. And not to forget my last remark, which is also important, is that if entertaining content is debated, valued, shared with others, this can not only take on very different media uh, mediated forms, um, it is also shared with others, usually on two levels. Either it's addressed to a big, uh, to a large mass of people in terms of published comment, and thus uh, it's a sociable activity. If people like something and share it on Facebook, it can be that they make it public and they mean to address strangers and it's, uh, it's a relation ship that is fairly fairly oral fairly non-committedly and uh, like nothing personal okay and on the other side and i am referring to joachim höflich by this uh, on the other side what is shared in terms of entertainment with others can also address very specifically the in-group of the person. For instance, other fans or your family, your own friends. It's people that I know. And so it's meant on a very personal level. And it's uh, the person that shares something, asks for some feedback, for some answer. OK. These are the preliminary theoretical framework things that I wanted to uh, bring in in this discussion. And what I would like to do in the remaining 10 minutes or maybe five minutes is to claim, is the claim to underline my basic claim that pop culture songs, pop songs that make the charts that are number one hits um, are used by avid media users um, in terms of entertaining research. Uh, people listen, people watch the videos, but they also come up with their own forms. They make videos or they, just like me here, they share their own versions of pop songs. So now the big question is, how is all of this relevant to teaching music? How is this all relevant with regards to teaching languages through music? I would like to make an example uh, because I think it's uh, in some way self-explanatory. And I also would add, uh, like to add some remarks that may open up the discussion again with regards to interactive uses of creative uses um, of pop music. So, uh, all I said so far can be boiled down to one claim. Avid users of media as avid connoisseurs of pop culture do not only buy music uh, and consume music, they also share music by singing, by adding uh, lyrics, by translating texts in order to better understand what they're singing, and more importantly, also, um, they come up with their own textual versions. They adapt 
and they like to share um, what they come up with with others in terms of more impersonal sharing. Look what I've done! Or in, form, in the form of very personal sharing. Look, dear friend, that is my version of the song. Come on, go, sing your version and we compare which one is better and then we uh, we are in in a, like in a chorus together. So the social aspect of this self um, performance on the web is not to be uh, neglected. My example here comes from a very popular film franchise. Uh, it's the Hunger Games and uh, the phenomenon I'm talking about is related to the latest installment of the Hunger Games, which is Hunger Games Mockingjay. And in the fiction, in the book already, in the book series, uh, there is a song that is sung by the main character. The main character of the Hunger Games trilogy both in the book and in the film, is Katniss Everdeen, played by Jennifer Lawrence. And in the third, no, in the second book, which is the third film, it's complicated, she, the main character, sings a song that her father has taught her. And the song is a very sad song and it's called The Hanging Tree. In the story, this song will become the protest song of the whole movement that Katniss Everdeen is leading practically against her will. And among people that are familiar with the film franchise, it's also clear that the actress, Jennifer Lawrence, was not pleased when the director uh, practically urged her and forced her to sing a song. Um, Maybe after my talk, you can listen to the song and maybe listen uh, to one or two fan versions that circulate on the web. Um, the song, The Hanging Tree, immediately after the film was launched, was shared wildly on the internet in all kinds of mostly illegal downloads. Sony the, the owner of the franchise did everything to stop this illegal downloads. What is interesting to me as an ethnographer is that apparently young people were not afraid they would um, violate any copyrights because they felt the urge to sing the song of Katniss Everdeen and in some way become part of this fictional protest movement. So it was a very beautiful way of uh, bringing yourself into the fictional world of the Hunger Games. Um, now, the song is a very simple song. It's a really, truly folk song. And uh, you can call what all of these fans did. You can call it filking because um, they did some folkloristic exercise with a popular pop song um, and um, yes uh, a lot of this activity was highly creative and all of this activity was highly social meant to be shared with others meant to be evaluated with the term yeah you did good or bad so um, this Practically is my last slide of my presentation. <clears throat> uh, what makes the case of the hanging tree interesting for teachers, because it is a natural resource for learning, is that all of the young people, let's say 95% of all young people, at least that I know, uh, are familiar with the context of the song and can give the song some particular meaning. 
uh, so they will reflect on the song and on its context. Second, if young people are playfully invited to sing that song, they have to come up with their own version because in the original fiction there are two versions. That's the H that comes into play. The song that is learned is a sad song which could insinuate that at in the end people die. And there is a rope that is introduced um, as a means for suicidal activities. On the other hand, the song is also in circulation with another word which is hope with H. And the whole meaning of the song is different because there is no suicide, it's just a hope for love. And so if people sing the song and maybe upload their version of the song or discuss with others and evaluate, they must be aware that they have to choose which version they want. Is it the sad version, the dystopian version that connects to the whole story of the film and the book? Or is it the happy version, which has also so in the context of the story some ideological meaning? So to end, because I have 30 seconds left, um, what I want to suggest is that entertaining material such as pop song that are already inviting for creative activities are more actively, actively used for learning languages. In this kind, in this, uh, in this moment, English, and there is ample um, occasion for very important reflection. Thank you very much.